everybody, welcome back to another awesome Adobe Live. I am Jesus Ramirez. I'll be your um, host for today. Today is a getting started session with masking. How are you doing today? I already see a lot of familiar faces in the chat. I see Claudia from Print My Soul, Tim as always. Uh, Tim, I've heard Jesus is a pretty cool guy. You've heard correctly, Tim. You got some very good sources. Um, who else do we have here? Hey, Steve, good to see you. Sean, um, Lindsay, how are you? Thank you guys so much for being here with me. It's a beautiful morning here in the San Francisco Bay Area. It is 7.30 a.m. Let me know in the chat where you're watching from. I know we have people from Europe. I know Tim is in Europe, Claudia's in Europe. Let me know where you guys are at. Uh, I believe you're also in Europe, right, Steve? If Hopefully memory serves me correctly. Hey, Carol, good morning, how are you? Um, thank you guys so much for joining me today. We're going to be talking about masking. This is gonna be a masking stream. So hopefully you guys get to learn um, the basics about how masking works. I'm gonna show you a couple advanced features that are not difficult at all. If this is your first time learning about masking, then it's gonna to be totally fine. I'm gonna go slow. Um, I'm gonna divide up everything into small digestible chunks so that you can follow along. So I know masking can be scary, but I'm gonna to try to demystify it today and just make it accessible for everybody. Awesome. <clears throat> cool. Oh, New Zealand. I'm sorry, Steve. New Zealand. Oh my God, I got that so wrong. Completely off. Sorry about that, Steve. Steve is watching from New Zealand. Um, we got Dave from Olympia, Washington. Nice. We got Sean from Germany. Uh, we have Lindsay from Missouri. Awesome. It must be golden hour in the studio look uh, and that fabulous hair. Oh, thank you. See, like, um, I have this this light, Tim, that, you know, I can make the light brighter or dim it down, you know, and change the color if I want. So I, I, I thought I would go for, like, a nice warm morning look because it's, you know, so early in the morning. It's 7.30. So, yeah, definitely golden hour in the studio. <laughs> um, awesome. All right, so yeah, so that's what we're gonna um, discuss today. Before I move uh, further, I just wanna mention the schedule for the day. Today, we're gonna start with me um, doing the Getting Started with Masking, 7.30 a.m. Pacific. Right after me, we have Kathleen Martin doing the Photoshop Daily Creative Challenge, which will be very exciting. Exciting. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, today is challenge number one, so make sure that you go into behance.net slash challenge slash Photoshop so that you can join Kathleen in the Photoshop Daily Creative Challenge. Um, we have hand lettering with Ann Chen at 9.30 a.m. Pacific. Then at 11.30, we have Illustrator Daily Creative Challenge with Andrew Hutchcradle. And at noon, we have Brittany Eric doing Adobe XD workflows and pro tips and Andrea Hawk at 2 p.m. Pacific doing the Adobe XD Daily Creative Challenge. And we'll end the day with Alice Lee doing a doodle therapy. So it's a very, very exciting day. Make sure that you stick around and check everyone out. It will be awesome. Let me switch my screen over into my screen. And I just wanted to show you the Behance.net challenge slash Photoshop page where you can follow Kathleen. Make sure that you click on this big blue button so you can take the challenge with, with her. Also join the community chat and yeah, today is challenge number one. It's not even unlocked yet, but you, June 9th will have the box will unlock right as she comes on and you can follow along with her. So make sure that you check her out. Cool. Let me see if there is anything in the chat. Oh, Claudia says make it blue. I think she was talking about the the light. So yeah, I can make the light blue. So there's there it is. It's blue now. <laughs> um, or it could be any color that I want, but we're gonna go with the golden hour yellow as Tim was suggesting. Super fancy, yeah, I like these lights. So these are, um, I think they're called happy lights and I got them off Amazon. They're really, really cheap because they're not photographer lights. Usually when you attach the word photographer or photography to a product, they jack up the price. So I just bought these outdoor RGB lights for like $20 and there's two of them and you can control them with your phone. They're super cool, so yeah. Um, hello, Jesus and everyone. Are you wearing a mask? I'm not wearing one now, but if I have to leave the house, then yes, I do have to wear a mask. Um, awesome. Uh, Lindsay wrote, I thought it was just his reading glow. Yeah, part of it is the glow. Part of it is the glow. The other part is the happy light. Um, 
Yeah, every, Carol is writing that she recalls being afraid of masking in Photoshop, and now it's a challenge in Illustrator. Yeah, I think masking was one of those things that everyone is always so worried about, and you know, it's just not an intuitive thing. So hopefully, with um, what I'm going to show you guys today, how I'm going to explain it, hopefully, if you're a beginner, hopefully that fear goes away and it kind of starts making sense in your head. Um, awesome. Uh, are they light Try purple? Um, the lights are RGB lights, so I can try purple. So see now, now it's purple. <laughs> so now may maybe I could just change lights throughout like the entire stream, but that's purple. But I'll go back to the yellow. <laughs> um, we have um, Sean. I sense the theme for these streams uh, at this hour. Yesterday was uh, mask, and today is mask. Yeah. The yes. Well, yesterday was. Um, like an actual face mask with Paul Tranny. I think he was doing it in Illustrator. So yeah, we're not going to be talking about that kind of mask. We're going to be talking about hiding and showing pixels. But yeah, it's uh, two different kinds of masks. But I get what you're saying. Um, cool. All right. So let's. Why don't we jump right into Photoshop now? Let's let's get going. So I'm going to start in the in the beginning. So. Um, I want to make this very accessible to everyone. So we're just going to go with the very, very basics to begin with. So we have layers in Photoshop here. This is the layers panel here on the bottom right. This is where it is by default. If for whatever reason you're working on a panel and you're brand new to Photoshop and you drag it out and you know you lose it and you close it and you don't know where it went, what you can do is go into window and select layers and it comes back and you can click and drag it and dock it back into that area and it will appear. So just in case you don't know where, where the layers panel is. And also if that happens, the easiest way quite frank with you is to click on the drop down menu and then just reset your current workspace. Notice that I have a workspace called DCC. So that's the um, daily creative challenge. Um, usually I like to have my workspace um, a certain way when I do my challenges, although I don't think I saved the right version because usually when I teach, I like to close these panels and just have two rows instead of the three. But anyway, it'll still get the layers panel back. So, um, and actually I'll put the properties panel up here as well so that it's easy to see. And by the way, when you click and drag on a panel and you see that blue highlight, you can just drop it in that area. So we have a layer here in the layers panel. And the layers, you can see we have this layer called woman, man, and background. And notice that the layer on top hides the layer at the bottom. So the layer stack does have an influence of how the final piece looks like. So you have to keep that in mind. The layer on top hides the layer on the bottom. But sometimes when you're working on in Photoshop, you may want to show parts of the layer in the bottom for various reasons. One of the most common reasons is compositing. Maybe you want to swap the background from your photo, kind of like the green screen is swapping out the background here with the software and you can see like the application that's masking or they call it um, keying in video, but it's the same theory where you basically hide pixels so that only part of the image, the layer of the video is revealed. In Photoshop, you do that by using a layer mask. This icon here, when you click on this icon that has a square with a circle in it, a filled circle, you'll create a layer mask. And by default, the layer mask is white. White reveals, black conceals, and the different shades of gray give you different shades of opacity. So by default, the layer is white, which means that everything shows. But if you select the brush tool and make black your foreground color. You can paint with um, black to reveal the pixels in the back. Super cool stuff, right? I mean, you can just selectively paint and it brings it back. If you want to see what you painted, you can hold Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac, and click on the layer mask thumbnail, and you'll see that the mask is simply black in some areas. And those are the areas that are hidden. See that? Again, I'm holding Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac. See that? Super cool. And whatever is in white is revealed. So that's that's basically the simplest way of explaining it. It's a it's a the a mask is attached to a layer. 
and you can paint with black, white, or different shades of gray to show or hide pixels. White reveals, black conceals, and the different shades of gray give you different shades of opacity. And you might be wondering, well, how many shades of gray do we have? Well, the answer to that is very, very simple. If you double click on the foreground color picker, you can see the RGB values here, and they range from zero, which is completely black. You see that RGB here? And if I drag up, notice that the number starts going up, 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 all the way until it gets to white at 255. So you have 255 shades of gray, including black and white. So that's how many different levels of opacity you can have on a mask. See that? Zero is black, and I'm gonna drag up. Look at the RGB. See, I'm gonna go very slow. See, I can go one RGB value at a time. See that? And I can go all the way up to 255. So whenever you see brightness at 100%, you're really dividing um, like a, a value, right? Like 50%. If I go to 50% um, brightness, in reality, that's 128 values of gray. So keep that in mind. So you have 255 values of gray, which gives you 255 values of opacity on a mask, on an on a, um, 8 bit image. I should make that clear. Cool. Let me see if there's any questions in the chat so far. Where's the 50 shades of gray joke? <laughs> I don't know, Lindsay, maybe you should come up with it. Um, I know that uh, Carol said I, I was sure thinking of it. Awesome. <laughs> um, cool. No questions yet. Awesome. So yeah, so that's that's the very, very basic of a mask. The difficult thing with a mask, and by the way, I'm just going to delete this uh, layer mask. The diff difficult thing is to apply those levels of gray, black, or white to the areas that you want to apply it for uh, to. In Photoshop, there's so many different ways of creating a selection around a subject. One of the oldest tools in Photoshop is the magic wand tool, which allows you to click on an area and Photoshop just selects similar pixels. And you can hold shift and start clicking on, you know, different areas and Photoshop will select more pixels that are similar to the color that you selected. And nowadays that tool seems very basic because there's tools that do a lot better in finding the edges of the subject you're trying to select. Um, right after the magic wand tool, Photoshop came out with a quick selection tool that just allowed you to click and drag over an area like so, and Photoshop will automatically find the edges of your subject. See that? Like so. And I'm just clicking and dragging and finding the edges in my subject. Like so. And if you make a mistake when you're doing this, like for example, you you know, maybe you your hand just moves and you go over the edge, all you have to do is hold Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac, and click and drag to deselect. Like so. So you're deselecting. Very simple, right? If you forget the keyboard shortcuts, no problem. You can go into the options bar and just click on this little plus icon or the minus icon to add or subtract to your selection. The um, so then this tool is the one that was used very, very often in, you know, I would say the last maybe 10 years and uh, to create a selection around a subject. And what would happen at this point is that you would click on that layer mask icon, the one that we talked about earlier. And when you click on that and there's a selection active, Photoshop makes a layer mask based on the selection. And actually, I should say that a uh, a selection in reality is a mask. If you go into the channels panel, um, actually, sorry about that. If you press the Q key and you go into the channels panel, you can see the quick mask. See, there it is right here at the bottom. It's just a black and white image in reality. That's what Photoshop is looking at it behind the scenes. And a quick mask, um, you can enable it by pressing the Q key like so. And actually, um, you can even change the opacity and the color of the quick mask by clicking on the quick mask icon here. See that? like so. But anyway, a quick mask allows you to see in red the areas that are going to be hidden. And you can use the brush tool to paint with black and white, again, to hide pixels when painting with black or show pixels where, uh, when painting with white. 
And the cool thing about a quick mask is that it's not a mask yet, although behind the scenes in the in the in the um, channels panel it is, but in the layers panel where we see it and interact with it, it's really not it's still a selection. So that means that, for example, I have my quick mask active, and if I were to paint with white on these areas and press Q again, you can see how now this is a selection. It's not really a mask yet. But anyway, so the point that I was trying to make is that the selection is basically a mask, and when you want to turn it into an actual mask so that it stays on your layer in the layers panel, all you have to do is click on this icon, and then it becomes a mask here which is basically the same thing here where it says uh, man mask right there. That's basically what I had earlier in the quick mask mode. Also, when you're in the mask here, you can press the um, backslash key, which is the key right next to the bracket keys right next to the letter P. So in North American keyboards to the right of the letter P, you have the bracket keys and next to that you have the backslash key um, right under the backspace key. And you can enable this red rubylith overlay that shows is basically the same thing. So this is not the quick mask anymore, but sometimes when you're working in Photoshop and you really need to see what the mask is not selecting or selecting, and it's really difficult to see in a composite sometimes, you just press that backspace key and then you can see that red overlay and then press that key again to take it away. Similar to the quick mask, but not the same because it's, no, it's already a mask. You just wanna get that overlay again so that you can visually see what's going on. Cool. Let me see if there's any questions in the chat. Um, if that is a question, are you using a tablet? If that, I'm, I'm guessing that question is for me. Not at the moment, I, I do use a tablet, but when I teach, I think it's just easier to use a mouse since, I don't know, I, I just got used to teaching with using a mouse. So when I teach, I use a mouse like 90% of the time. Um, cool. So let me see. Um, what we're going to talk about next. So that was the uh, quick selection tool, right? The quick selection tool allows you to just click and drag and make a selection. But in Photoshop 2020, we got a brand new tool called the object selection tool. The object selection tool uses uh, Adobe Sensei, which is artificial intelligence machine learning technology that um, allows Photoshop to analyze an image and find the subject of the image. And it works really, really cool. There's two modes. There's a rectangle mode and the lasso mode. I prefer the lasso mode, but basically how this works is you can click and drag and make a box and Photoshop will look inside of that box and try to figure out what the main subject is and you can, uh, it, it makes a selection out of it. Um, it does a really good job in this case, but in a lot of cases I prefer to use the lasso tool because it just allows me to like do a really rough selection like so over like the areas that I want and then Photoshop analyzes the image and it finds the main subject. So I think in most cases, that's probably the way that I would do it. Also, just a, another handy keyboard uh, shortcut for you, Control D on Windows, Command D on the Mac to deselect. I developed a really bad habit when I was learning Photoshop when I had a selection. Um, let me just make another selection really quick. This is a really bad habit, don't do this. Um, but I still catch myself doing it because when I was learning Photoshop, I didn't know how to deselect. So what I would do is I would come into the ellipt uh, rectangular marquee tool and just like click on the selection and it would disappear. And I realized that that would happen. So then I just started doing it. I did it for many, many years before I learned the keyboard shortcuts. Even to this day, if I'm not thinking, I'm just going really fast, I still go back to those old habits, uh, bad habits. So that's why I encourage you to learn the keyboard shortcuts and learn good habits. So um, yeah, Control D on Windows, Command D on the Mac to deselect. And actually, Control Shift D, Command Shift D on the Mac brings back a selection that you had active before. So for example, if you make a selection and then you decide you don't want it and then you're doing other things and you think, oh, I want that old selection that I was using earlier, Control Shift D, Command Shift D on the Mac to bring it back. Cool. Um, Adobe's kicking butt almost to $400 a, ch a share. Their AI learning is amazing. Awesome, yeah. It is pretty cool. <laughs> Milena wrote, I used to deselect the same manner. Yeah, it's just like when you're learning, you don't know the keyboard shortcuts and you don't know all the menus. So then you develop, you, you do something and it works and you just keep doing it over and over again. So yeah, totally, totally get why that became a habit for me and for other people as well. Um, Cool. 
let's see. Um, so we talked about the object selection tool. And again, it uses Adobe Artificial Intelligence, known as Adobe Sensei. And there's actually another tool that's similar to that under the Select menu. If you go under Select and you click on Subject, Photoshop would just analyze the entire image and make a selection. And there's actually a brand new tool inside of the Properties panel. Unfortunately, it doesn't work on smart objects. I have a smart object uh, right now. Um, this is actually a cloud-based smart object, but it's still really the same thing, not a raster layer. So it wouldn't work. But if this were a regular pixel layer, so let me just rasterize it. You can see now that in the Properties panel under Quick Actions, I have two buttons, Select Subject, which is basically the same thing that I just did a second ago from the Select menu, and uh, Add it to Photoshop 2020 just recently was the remove background button. You click on that and Photoshop will analyze the image, make a selection and apply a layer mask all in one click, which I think works fantastic. My only um, issue with that is that I have to rasterize the layer. So if I'm working with a smart object like I am here, then I can't use it. So what I would do in that case is go into select subject and just create my mask that way by clicking on this icon with the mask is already active. So that's my workaround to not being able to use the remove background feature on a smart object. But um, so yeah, so that's how you would make a selection using the, to uh, the toolbar. Recently, Photoshop added a um, new workspace. Uh, I think it was maybe three versions ago. Uh, somebody might correct me in the ch in the chat, but I think it was like Photoshop 2014, I want to say something like that. Uh, maybe 2013. Uh, uh, Adobe added the selected mask workspace. That is a dedicated workspace to making selections and masking, and we're gonna talk about that in a moment. But before I do, I want to show a quick trick. For those of you that are old school Photoshop users like me and still prefer the old way of working, you can still get back to it. Um, if you go into the select menu and click, oh, maybe they removed it. There used to be a way of bringing it back, but maybe not. Let me try that one more time. And if it doesn't work, then that means that it's not there anymore. I, You used to be able to go into select and click on uh, select and mask and the... Um, the old way of working used to come out, but I guess in the new versions of Photoshop, you can't do that. So never mind on that. I didn't try it in a while, but you used to be able to go into the select menu and hold shift and click on selected mask and the old uh, pop up with the um, refine edge dialog box used to come up. So I guess that's not available in 2020. I haven't tried it since uh, this release of version, this release of Photoshop. Um, but yeah, so yeah, Carol wrote hold shift while doing that. Um, yeah, so you used to be able to do it in older versions of like, you know, I know it worked for sure like in 2019 because I, I tried it. I didn't try it on this version, but anyway, so never mind on that. And no worries if if, um, if you're a new user, it's not going to matter because you're going to be used to the new way. I was just trying to show the the people with the um, old uh, old habits the, the who liked using the old tools how to bring it back. But I guess they, they no longer... Um, they no longer allow you to do it, but it doesn't matter. So what I'm gonna do now is just simply select my layer, go into select and select and mask. You could also select one of the selection tools, any one of these selection tools and click on select and mask button in the options bar and it comes up. So the most important thing in this panel is, um, oh, Tim wrote, I believe you have to make a selection first. Oh my God, Tim, is that is that the case? Is, let me see, Tim. I think, you know what, I think you're right. Yeah. Oh my God, Tim. Thanks so much, man. So, yeah. so you're right. So you have to make a selection first because I was thinking that it works like the new selected mask workspace. See, I wasn't even thinking right there. So the new selected mask workspace is an actual workspace that you go in and you can start your selection from scratch, which is now the way that I'm used to working. The old way of working was you needed a selection first and then you would refine it. And if you click on selected mask when you have a selection active, you basically um, start from scratch and you can adjust these these sliders and tools and we'll go with that um, in a moment. But um, what Tim just wrote in the chat and he um, was completely right is in the old way, you needed to have a selection first and then 
you will hold shift, go into select, and then select and mask while holding the shift key and having a selection active. And that will bring up the old refine edge window. A lot of people prefer it. I'm not sure why I like the new version better, but if you're someone who prefers the old version just because you're used to it and that's how you like to work, this is one way of bringing it back. Actually, the only way I can think about bringing it back. So thanks for letting me know in the chat, Tim, that you needed to have a selection active because as you as you guys saw, the select and mask, um, the refine edge window is to refine an edge. So we're not really starting the selection, we're just refining it. So with the new dialog box or the new workspace, you're actually starting from scratch and also refining it, which I prefer. So anyway, and also the algorithm's a little different on how these sliders work. And I think it's better in the new one, but again, some people disagree and some people prefer the old one and that's totally cool. That's why we call him Tim Say. Yes, Tim, that's why we call you Tim Say. Um, Awesome. But yeah, so with the layer selected, I'm going to go into filter, I'm sorry, not filter, select and select and mask. And from the right hand side, the first thing that you want to do is select the view mode that you're going to view your selection in. Notice that right now I'm in onion skinning mode and the transparency is set to 20%. If I set it to 0%, I get the orig original image. If I set it to 100%, I get the background. So foreground and background. So you probably want to be somewhere in between so that you can see what you're working on. And then when you go into the select subject button here, you can click on that and Photoshop will just automatically make a selection. Notice how now he is visible at 100% uh, opacity and everything else is not. So the background, the his background, and the background image. See that? So now I can really see how my selection is going to affect the image that I'm working with. If you can also use the quick selection tool, quick selection tool, which is here. You also have the refine edge tool, the brush tool, the object selection tool, just like we had in the actual, I mean, still Photoshop, but in the actual toolbar of the main application, not the selected mask workspace and they work the same. So all these tools work the same as they do in the main application. So if you needed to add to your selection, you can come and click and drag to add to your selection and it adds it as you can see there, or you can subtract from the selection to remove those pixels from the selection. Also, if you need to see your image better, you can have different options. You have the marching ants, the overlay, on black, on white, and the mask view on layers and onion skinning. In this case, I'm going to I'm going to do on black just so we can figure out how these sliders work. And then I'm going to zoom in to this area and I'm going to paint with black by clicking on this minus here and then subtracting those areas that shouldn't be selected and then just maybe fine tuning the edges here like so. But anyway, so what I'm going to do now is make sure that I have good edges in my mask. And the way that I'm going to do so is by using these sliders. And the one thing I'm going to mention right now is that I'm not going to worry about his hair. His hair is the last thing that I'm concerned about right now. The reason being is that the edges on his hair are very different than the edges around his body. So I like to do two separate adjustments with the edge selection sliders. The first set of adjustments that I make are for his entire body, including his hair. And the second set of adjustments that I make are only for his hair. Maybe they'll affect the body just a tiny little bit, but I want to make sure that I get all the edges right before I go work with the hair because they require two very different sets of adjustments. And if I just do one global adjustment, then I'm not going to get as good of results as, as if I separate them into two. Cool. Um, let me go ahead and go back into on white. And when you make a selection, obviously one of the most important things to look at is the edges of an image. So you can see the edges here. And in a lot of cases, you're going to get a lot of jagged edges when you make one of these adjustments or selections rather with the artificial intelligence. 
So one of the first things that I usually do when using uh, this type of method is adjusting the smooth slider. I just click and drag the smooth slider to the right. And I'm just going to bump it all the way so you can see the difference. See that? Before, or actually that's after, and this is before. See that? See how the edges are just much, much smoother? Obviously, you probably don't want to go that far. So you probably want to just fine tune it accordingly so that the edges are no longer so jagged and they're smooth enough, but they still follow the contours of the object that you're trying to select. Cool. And then in this case, I don't need it, but sometimes you may need to blur your edge. So that's what feather allows you to do. I don't need it in this case. So I'm going to keep the blur at zero, the feather at zero. And then I have contrast. Contrast will make the darker pixels darker and the brighter pixels dark, uh, brighter. Oh, wait, did I say that right? <laughs> darker pixels darker, brighter pixels brighter. Yeah. So that just helps you create a sharper edge as well. So I can increase the contrast just to create a sharper edge. And then I have the shift edge slider, which allows you to move the selection in or out. Usually I don't, I don't really rely on this too much. I'm going to show you a filter a little later on that allows you to get more control. So usually what I do with shift S edge is I just add a little bit, maybe, you know, never more than 20%. I probably usually stay around the 15% mark just to push it in just a tiny little bit. And then I can go back into my onion skinning view so that I can see how these adjustments affected the image. And it's looking very, very good. I think again, his hair, looks horrible it looks very cut out and we're gonna fix that later but for now that looks really really good and what i'm gonna do now is make sure that my output settings are okay so i can output to a layer mask or a new layer new layer with layer mask new document new document with layer mask so i'm just gonna select layer mask because i want that selection that i just made to be turned into a layer mask with my currently selected layer. So I'll press OK and Photoshop will apply that layer mask onto my um, layer and it makes it seem like this guy is standing in front of that street. Now, if I zoom in, you'll see that the edges look pretty good, except for the hair. The filter that I was talking about a moment ago is the minimum filter that allows you to contract the mask. There's also the maximum filter, which allows you to expand a mask. If you go into with the layer mask selected, if you go into filter, other, minimum, you'll see that fil filter that I'm talking about right now is one pixel. But if I increase the pixels, you can see how I'm contracting that mask. See that really cool stuff. And also I have the preserve algorithm selected as squaredness for an organic object like a person that has a lot of smooth round edges and not really any hard corners. I would probably switch the algorithm to roundness and that gives me a better result. And in this case, I don't really need it too much, but usually if there's fringing those halos that you see around selections, I would probably come in here, maybe add a pixel or two worth of contractions. And the reason that you want to use the minimum filter besides the algorithm, which is already a good enough reason, um, then using something else like having a selection and going into select, modify and contract is that you also get the ability to use decimal points. So you don't have to use like a whole pixel. You can do like, um, you know, like a, like in this case, 1.3 pixels. So it's not whole numbers, which is, gives you more control. So, this is what I like to do in this case, you know, we'll just keep it at 1.3 and I'll press, oh, actually before I press, okay, I want to show you one thing. So you probably have seen the checkbox, right? The preview checkbox that allows you to see the before and after of whatever that box or that control is doing. But you can also press the P key on the, P, uh, on the keyboard to enable and disable the preview checkbox on any dialog box, not just the minimum dialog box. So P key for preview. So if you see that preview checkbox, the P key on the keyboard will enable it or disable it. And I'll press OK. Let me see. The, the minimum diet lose 200 pounds in four seconds. That's right, Tim. I definitely need some of that because I've been in like all of you. I've been in lockdown and oh, man, it's so much easier to eat when you don't leave the house. <laughs> And we have Adobe Live in the chat. Hey, Adobe Live, how's it going? Um, but anyway, so we have our mask. So remember, the first, 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 first thing that we did was mask him out, and we adjusted the edges over his entire body. 
but his hair. His hair is not looking the way that we want. So like I said, I like to do the masking with select and mask in two steps. First step, overall body. Second step, hair, just because they require two different sets of adjustments to uh, for it to look right. So what I'll do now is double click on the mask to bring up the selected mask workspace. By the way, the very, very first time that you do that, when you double click on a mask, Photoshop will ask you if you want the double click to bring up the selected mask workspace or to bring up the properties of the mask. I would say use the selected mask option, but if you've already done so, then it'll take you into the selected mask. Um, it'll take into the properties panel for the layer mask. So when that happens, then just click on selected mask here and it will come up. Just uh, letting you guys know. But anyway, we are going to switch over into a different view just so that things are easier to see. I'm going to go into the on white view and I'm going to increase the opacity just so that we can see our selection on a white background. So you can see that the edges are looking great except for his hair. And we also have um, this tool here, which is the refine edge tool. And it kind of looks like a brush going over hair if you look at the icon. So that is what um, we're going to use. And let me just take a quick look at the chat, make sure we're okay. Um, Eric is writing, we have free food at work, but I like my own home cooking better. Nice. What do you like to cook? Oh man, I see we're having a lot of financial talk. Everybody's talking about their portfolio. Nice. I'm glad to see you guys are investing. <laughs> awesome. Cool. So we have the Refine Edge Brush tool selected here, the, the brush that looks like it's painting over hair. And I'm going to use the bracket keys and the keyboard to increase the size of my brush. And then I'm just going to click and drag like this over his hair. See that? So now his hair is starting to look a bit more um, realistic than what I had before. And if you really want to, you can click on this show edge checkbox and you can see what that tool is analyzing. And if you really wanted to focus on just the hair, I can come in with the minus, uh, option here in the toolbar and just subtract anything that I really don't want Photoshop to analyze. I just want Photoshop to focus on the hair like so. And then I can uncheck this and hopefully that gives me a better result. And I think that it does. And then I can just press OK. In this case, I wouldn't actually there's one thing I might do. I was going to say I really wouldn't adjust any of these sliders because these sliders probably wouldn't give you a good result with hair. The one that you might consider adjusting is the shift edge slider. Maybe you can just shift the edge just a tiny, tiny little bit just so that you get rid of like those pixels that are just like almost, almost visible or like they're actually barely visible. I should say pixels that are ba barely visible and just make them invisible. And then I can press OK. So that gives me a much, much better result as you can see there. So this is why I like to do my selected mask in two passes. The first pass will give me a great outline over his entire body. And the second pass just focuses on the hair and I get a much better result than doing it all in one pass. Let me duplicate the layer and just kind of explain that in case it's confusing for some of you. So if I go into selected mask, right? So I have my layer selected, select, selected mask, and I click on the select subject button. Photoshop will make you know, my, my selection. And actually, you know what, before I do that, let me disable this layer at the bottom so this doesn't confuse us. Sorry about that. So select, select and mask. There we go. And I'll click on select subject. It creates my selection, right? And then if I, you know, do the same thing, adjust the smoothing, adjust the shift edge, maybe a little bit of contrast and do all that stuff that I did before. And then I come in here and I start adjusting my edge. Notice that the edges no longer look as good. See that? Because Photoshop is also applying the smoothing, the contrast, and the shift edge to this area. So obviously it won't give you the, the best result. So that's why I like separating it into two. So I hope that makes sense. I'll press OK on this. And obviously 
the original layer that we worked on is going to give us much better results. So I'm going to delete this layer because we don't need it anymore. And what you need to do at this point is select the mask and come in with the brush tool and with white as your foreground color, you can just reduce the size of your brush by tapping on the left bracket key on the keyboard right next to the letter P. And then just paint with white on some of the areas that were accidentally hidden, like these highlights on his hair. I actually want those to, to show up. So I'm just painting over these areas that should be hit, that should be showing but are not. So just fine tuning the mask. And by the way, I'm holding the space bar to pan. So when you hold the space bar, you can click and drag to pan. And I'm just painting over the areas that I want to bring back. But I think the hair looks pretty good just for a couple clicks. Um, oh, cool. Uh, Eric loves cooking ribs, chicken wings, and pork steak. Just a large amount of meat. Sorry to the vegans. Love you all. <laughs> awesome. But yeah, I'm, I'm definitely a meat eater myself. But anyway, so this is um, how you would go about using the Selected Mask workspace. Now you might be thinking, well, that's all fine and dandy, but what happens when you have a more difficult to mask um, thing like hair like you know like a, a lady's hair where it's flowing like that and it's got a lot of different hair strands and all of that well actually the trick is just about the same the only difference is that you do have to disregard hair that just doesn't work sometimes um the hair is too blurry or sometimes if you're not using a solid background which i recommend of course is the the issue becomes that the hair is too similar to whatever's behind the person so it becomes really difficult to select so you have to disregard it and or paint it back in by hand or using a brush. And that's what I'm going to show you in this next example. <laughs> Say multo bravo tesoro. That's uh, Claudi from Print My Soul's mom, Julie, saying uh, good job, basically. So <laughs> good to see you, Julie. <clears throat> um, or ciao, Julie. Um, but anyway, so we have the um, layer selected here. And I'm going to do the same thing I did before, but the only difference will be how I'm going to fix the hair issues. So with this layer selected, I'm going to go into select, select and mask, and I'll do the same thing. Click on the select subject button to select my main subject. There she is. And I'll add a little bit of smoothing to smooth those edges contrast to make the edges sharper and I'll shift the edge inward and I'll press OK. Then I'll go into filter, other, minimum, same steps as before, and I'll even do the same radius. So I'm going to contract the mask. I'm going to bring the mask in a pixel um, in a third more or less, and that brings it in. Next, I'll double click on the thumbnail there to bring up my selected mask workspace and I'll select the refine edge tool and I'll do exactly the same thing. Like so, and in this case, we're also doing a really, really good job and I'll press okay. Now, as you can see, some areas are just gonna be really, really difficult to select. A lot of these areas. So we're gonna have to paint some of those strands of hair back in. Also, you have to be careful when you do the selected mask and use the artificial intelligence because you might miss some areas. If you miss an area like that, just select the brush tool and then paint with black. Um, if black is not your foreground color, just press the D key. Um, actually, no, not the D key, the D key. So this is the weird thing. So if you're in a, in a, regu in a regular layer, the D key makes the foreground black but if you're in a layer mask and you press the D key, it makes it white. So that always confuses me. So I don't know if that was a clear to you guys, but if you're in a, if you have this white outline around the layer mask and you press the D key for the default colors, the foreground will become white. If you're on a regular pixel layer and you are in whatever color and you press the D key, the foreground will become black, not white. So you just got to remember that. In this case, I wanted to make my foreground color black, so I pressed the D key, but then it didn't work because I'm on a layer mask. So I do have to tap on the X key to swap those. I'm not sure why um, they don't just give you black as a foreground color in both cases. Um, it makes more sense to me to have them both be black because 
when you create a layer mask, it's already completely black. Like, uh, I'm sorry, completely white. The entire thing is completely white. So if you're going to paint in a mask, by default, I assume that you are going to hide something because everything's already showing. So I'm not sure what the logic was behind that, but that's what it is. Um, Carol said, I didn't know that. I, uh, I'm guessing you're talking about the whole black and white thing between a layer and a layer mask. But anyway, so with my selection active, what I'm going to do now is just delete the things that are not going to work for me, right? Or not delete, hide. I'm hiding. Nothing. We're not deleting anything. We're just hiding. I can bring them back at any time. So like these pixels look really bad. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily want to keep them. So I would just hide the ones that don't work. These look good. So I'm going to paint with white to reveal them. So I'm just selectively hiding and revealing pixels here. Maybe the, the edges is probably what's going to be the hardest thing, right? Because her hair is so fine. There's so much of it that, you know, almost no technique will give you a perfect result. So you do have to disregard a lot of the hair. And then what you have to do is paint hair back in. And there's a lot of ways of painting hair back in, right? Um, you can create a new layer and you can just select the brush tool and then you can just bring it down to one pixel. And this works better with a Wacom tablet, by the way. And then hold Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac, and click to set my sample color, obviously her hair color, and then just you know start painting strands of hair like so. You know, just try to make it flow so that it matches her actual hair, and then just do it with different colors and do that over and over and over again. And you, you know, you might get a realistic result. And what you have to also do is take into consideration the depth of field. In some cases, the hair looks really blurry because of the depth of field of the portrait lens that um, the photographer used. If you have something that's blurry, well, then take your your strands of hair and go into filter, blur, Gaussian blur, and you can blur those those strands of hair so that they match, you know, the real strands of hair on her hair. So something like that, right? Um, but that's not the technique that I'm going to use. I'm, I just wanted to show you one of the things that you could you do to bring back those strands of hair that are missing. What I like to do instead is I like to use real hair, turn that into a brush and then paint with it. So let me show you how you would do that. This is one of those little uh, more advanced techniques that I'm going to show, but I think that it's easy to do when you guys can follow along. And it's also going to teach us one thing about masking. So we have this photo of this uh, lady here, and she is right up against a background that really makes her hair stand out and easy to select. So what I'll do is I'm just going to select the crop tool actually, and I'm just going to click and drag and just keep those strands of hair and maybe move up as well not to get her shirt because I really just want those strands of hair right so with the crop tool I crop everything else and just kept that strand of hair in Photoshop we talked about earlier how when we make a selection in reality we were making a channel so you can also make selections from channels so what I'm gonna do now is use a, a technique called a channel based selection if you go into the channels panel, you can see the red, green, and blue channel of the image. All those mixed together make up the RGB image, the complete image. This is red light, green light, and blue light. It's represented in the channel as black and white. White means a lot of light in the color of that channel, and black means no light in the color of that channel. So what you need to do is just select all the different channels and see which one has the most contrast between the foreground and background. In this case, the blue channel has the most contrast between the foreground, which is her hair, and the gray background. So I would just duplicate that channel by clicking and dragging it into the new channel icon. And from here, I can try to make her hair white and the background black. And the easiest way to do that is by pressing Control i on Windows, Command-I on the Mac to invert. Remember, white is what we keep. White is what we select. So I need her hair to be white because I want to keep her hair. I want to select her hair. And I want the background to be black because I want to hide it. I want to remove it. I don't want to select it. And then I can go into Image, Adjustment, 
levels and I can make the darker pixels darker and the brighter pixels brighter. With this point here, I can drag to the right, see this black point, and it's just gonna make more of those dark gray pixels black, like so. And I can press OK. Then I can select the burn tool and paint, and let me make the brush larger by tapping on the right bracket key on the keyboard right next to the letter P. I can make sure I select shadows because I only want to affect the shadows. So I'm gonna make the shadows darker. So I'm gonna paint, and that was way too much. Let me zoom in. See how I painted, and it just made everything so much darker? I don't wanna do that. I just wanna make the areas down here black, like so. And then what I may do actually is just paint, and I know they're gonna go away, and that's okay. But there's an awesome tool in Photoshop called the Fade Command. If you go into Edit and select Fade, It'll have the, the word fade and then the last tool that you use. In this case, um, we use the burn tool. And I can just fade that. See that? I can increase the opacity of that fade. So I can adjust it accordingly to remove those dark gray pixels but still keep the strands on her hair. And that's a good question. I wonder why Control J does, doesn't work in channels. That's a that's a good one. I, I actually wish Control J also duplicated the channels. I agree with you on that one, Sig. Um, so with this selection or not selection, with this channel active, what I'm going to do now is hold Control on Windows, Command on the Mac, and click to load that channel as a selection. Actually, if you want to be fancy, you don't even need to do that. What you can do is you see how there's a number here? Six, like two, three, four, five, and six. If you look at what number is there and then hold Control, Alt, and Windows, Command, Option, on the Mac, and that number, it'll select that channel. So in this case, Control, Alt, six, Command, Option, six, and the Mac will select that channel. Again, Control, Alt, and Windows, Command, Option, and the Mac, and then the number next to the channel, it'll load it as a selection. Or you can just hold Control on Windows, Command, and the Mac, and click on the channel thumbnail. Same thing. Um, with that selection active, I'm going to go back into the RGB channel or to the RGB composite, click on layers, and then just create a new solid color and I'll make it black. And I'll create another solid color and I'll make it white. So white background and those strands of hair. Then I'm going to go into edit, define brush preset, and I'll just call it hair like so. So now I can go into any document. So let me just go to another document so that you can see what's going on. So we have a document here and I can paint with that hair strand. See that? My foreground color, let me make it black and paint. So now I can paint with those strands of hair. Let me adjust my flow as well. See that? So now I can paint with that hair. So what I can do now is come into any image that I'm working on, add a new layer, and select her hair color, something similar. Maybe I'll go for one of the darker ones, like that one. And then I can adjust this, the brush size by tapping on the bracket keys on the keyboard. See that? There's, there's the hair. Try to match the scale. And I can paint. And then I can press Control T, Command T to transform, right click, flip it horizontal, and then just place it accordingly, like so. So that I have realistic edges and I can always warp it so that it matches the image better. And click on the check mark to commit the changes and maybe I'll place it behind her just so that we have those strands of hair that should look more realistic. And actually, you know what? I'm not liking it. I'm gonna do it again. If I don't like something, I'll just delete it and do it again. I can't show you, I can't have something that looked like that. Maybe I'll make it a little smaller and paint there. Let me see how that looks like. Yeah, I think that's better. Control T to transform, flip horizontal, and then rotate it. And what I think I didn't like was just the color and also the intensity, so maybe something like this. And I'll press Control J, Command J in the Mac a couple of times to duplicate it, and then I'll merge all those layers by holding Shift, clicking on all the layers, and then pressing Control E, Command E in the Mac. 
just so that I can have um, stronger strands of hair. And you can actually add a layer mask to this as well. You can add a layer mask and then paint with black using um, just a regular brush like that one there. And just hide the pixels that don't work with the composite. And this is just a regular pixel layer. So you can always go into itch, image adjustment and you know hue and saturation and then you can adjust the brightness of that hair saturation the hue so you can really really fine-tune it to make it look more like her actual hair and that's how you conceal the fact that you had it you had to remove some hair because it just didn't work with the mask it was too difficult to select and you just have to paint it back in. So this is a technique that I, I would use and you just have to replicate this process over and over and over and over again until you match her hair accordingly. Dana wrote, there is so much you can create in Photoshop, imagination is the only limit. I definitely agree with you on that. So let me just close this uh, window. I'll close this one as well because we don't need it. Oh, one thing I should mention. So if you create a brush like I just did there, something I would recommend doing is going into the um, brush settings, bringing up your brushes. So here it is my hair brush and you can just save it as a library asset. You can just click and drag it in there and it'll save us a library asset. And the reason that you wanna do that is so that that brush syncs with all your um, uh, computers where you have your Creative Cloud attached to. So if you create this on your laptop like I'm doing here, and then I move on to my desktop, that brush will transfer over in the libraries panel. For example, I already know I have, I, I didn't save it because I already know I have one there. Um, so if I go into hair, you'll see it, there it is. So notice, I'll select a different brush. So I'll select just like that brush. So look at the brush here. And I have this brush called hair, which is basically what I just showed you. When I click on it, Photoshop will select it and I can paint with that brush here. And this one's actually better because I took the time to add more contrast and you know really, really fine tune it. But um, anyway, that's that's the same, that's basically the same brush. And I saved it in my libraries panel so that I could always have access to it no matter where I am. All I need to do is log in into my account and see that? See how that just makes it look a lot more realistic because maybe the original strands of hair, and let me hide this so you can see, I had to hide a lot of them, they're too blurry, they just don't look right. So a lot of times what you have to do is simply hide them and then just paint them back in either one strand at a time or by using the technique that I just showed you but you know I'll quickly do it here I'll hide these strands of hair here and then enable that and that looks a little more realistic I probably would have to work with the color a bit more so with this icon here you can lock uh, transparent pixels so when you paint like for example I'm painting here I'm not painting with anything because I lock the transparent pixels so if I select her hair color here I can come in and paint with that same color over those pixels see that see so, so now it's, it's matching her hair much, much better. So I can just come in here and then just paint with her actual hair color so that it just blends in much better. And since I have the layer locked with transparency, I'm only gonna paint on the pixels that are already in that layer. I'm just painting over them. So it's a really, really great way of masking. I know this is not really masking, this is more like painting, but when you can't mask, this is what you have to do if you wanna have a realistic looking, looking image. So this is one of the, the secrets that uh, professionals use because sometimes you just can't mask, but you gotta make it look right. So see that? It looks from, let me just set it to 100%. So that's basically the 100% pixel view. See that? It looks it looks perfect. Even, even when you zoom in, it looks great. So I think that this is a technique you should definitely incorporate into your masking and compositing. Cool. Dave wrote, uh, Dave uh, Goodman wrote, hairbrush, ha ha ha, pun, definitely. Cool. Um, there's, we got about, uh, how much time do we have? We got about 20 minutes, give or take, 
And there's something I want to show you guys that it's not really masking, but it, it, I mean, it is because it allows you to show or hide pixels. And that's what we're talking about in this stream, showing or hiding pixels. And it helps you show and hide pixels in a different way. And let me show you what I mean by that. We have the blend if um, sliders in Photoshop. So let me just bring up this little um, graphic here, blend if, right? I have this layer here and this layer at the bottom is just a circular gradient from black to white and this linear gradient from black to white as well. And if you double click to the side of the layer, it brings up the layer style window. Right here, we have something called blend if. Blend if is actually something that a lot of people are also very confused, just like masking, but it, it has a lot of similarities. So if you understand one, then you understand the other. Notice the levels of gray that I was talking about, the uh, 50 shades of, of, of gray thing that we were talking about, zero, 255, the 255 shades of gray. Um, you know, zero is black, 255 is white. See, see the gradient here? So basically this says this layer and underlying layer. The this layer slider allows you to select the black point, you know, the zero and drag it to the right and see what happens there. And let me do the white one because I think it'll be more obvious. See that, see what's happening there? It just hides pixels, I'm just hiding them. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking any value of gray that is 168 or brighter and hiding it, see that? Or I can take the black point and drag it to the right. And what I'm doing now is taking any value that is 146 of gray, this shade of gray here, or darker and making that invisible. Super cool. You can also select one of these points, hold Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac and click, splits them in half. And now I have a smooth transition between invisible and visible points. So anything from 54 to zero is completely invisible. Anything from 54 to 144 is a gradual transition between invisible and visible pixels. So that's how this works. Really, really cool tool. The underlying layer has the opposite effect. The underlying layer, instead of hiding pixels, it brings them up. So if I click and drag on this black point, it'll bring up the pixels that are that shade of gray or darker. It just brings them up over the layer that's on top. Remember, layer stacking matters. We talked about that in the beginning. So what Blendif allows you to do is to bring up the layer in the bottom over the layer on top based on its brightness. And I can do that with the white point as well. You can see that there. Just makes it come up. And the reason that the layer on top disappears at a certain point is because now I've gone over all the shades of gray in that layer and it just hides everything. So super, super cool stuff. So you might be wondering, well, that's cool. Like, how do I use that? Well, if you're working on an image like this one here, right? This is just a design. It says clouds. And you want to make it seem like the clouds is on top of the word clouds. Then you can double click to the side of the layer and under underlying layer, you can click and drag on the white point and drag it to the left. Obviously, that looks way too harsh. The edges are too sharp, so you can split them in half to create a smooth transition. Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac and click. And now I have a smooth transition between visible and invisible pixels like so. And obviously you, you can fine tune it any way that you want. And then I can just move the word clouds and place it anywhere that I want. So that's one way you would use the blend if slider. So it's very, very easy to, to use. You don't have to create layer mass. It works great. Now let's take it to the next level. We, what if, what if, what if we have color? We talked about earlier how selections are just simply channels and black and white images. And if I go into the channels panel, once again, we have the red channel, the green channel and the blue channel. So the red channel, as we discussed earlier, um, gives you all the red light in your image. If an area in the red channel is bright or white, it means that there's a lot of red light. If it's black or dark, it means that there is no light or very little light of the color in that channel, in this case, red. So we look at the RGB image. The top part is where we have red. So obviously we have a lot of red light. The opposite of that is right back, uh, right down here, which is cyan very little light in the color of that channel or no light in the in, in, in that color. 
so red and the opposite is cyan. When I click on the red channel, you can see all that red light and nothing down here. See that? White and black. So keep that in mind, white and black. Then the green channel. So white on this side, which means there's a lot of green light and no light on this side. So here we'll have green. The opposite of green is magenta. So magenta will be there. And yeah, sure enough, here is green is bright or I'm sorry, green is here and magenta is here. And then we have the blue channel. Right here is really, really bright, which means there's a lot of blue light. Right here, there is no blue light, which means that it's yellow. Sure enough, blue here, yellow here. The most important to remember is that it's black and white in the channels panel, right? Black and white. So why don't we just start with the red channel? White on top, black on the bottom. Really easy to remember, right? Black on top, white at the bottom. We'll remember that. Then I'm gonna go into my image here and under the color wheel, I'm going to double click to the side of the layer to bring up the blend if sliders. And now under gray, I have the channels, red, green, and blue. We're gonna start with red. So remember what we said, right? Red, green, and blue channels, red. The red channel was white on top, dark at the bottom. Look at these points. We have a black point here that I can drag and a white point here that I can drag. Remember white was on top. So if I click and drag this one, notice how the circle starts disappearing from the top because that's the white areas in that channel. What was black? The bottom part of that channel, remember? So click and drag and the bottom parts disappear. Really cool stuff. In the blue channel, for example, we have blue here, yellow here. Blue means that there was a lot of light in that channel and yellow means that there is no light in that channel. So when I click and drag on the white point, the blue disappears click and drag on the black point, everything but the blue disappears. It's important to remember that I'm not hiding blue pixels or red pixels, I'm hiding the light in the channel. So if there's a lot of blue light, then I'll hide those pixels. The combination of all lights makes white. So if I have an area that is white, that means that the intensity of the blue channel is at 255, the intensity of the red channel is at 255, and the intensity of the green channel is at 255. So it, it it helps knowing that you're not hiding just the blue pixels in this case, I'm hiding the light in that channel. So I may hide things that are not necessarily blue. Um, an example would be white. I would also hide white. So what I'm going to do now is just press OK. So with that knowledge, how can we use this? Well, maybe you want to do a sky replacement, right? We have clouds and we have a sky. And if you go into the channels panel, you have the red, the green, and the blue channel. And look how much contrast there is between the leaves and the sky. If I were to try to make a selection out of this, it'll be really, really difficult and time consuming. I could probably do a channel based selection like I did with the hair when I was creating the mask. But again, it'll take some time. So what I can do instead is take advantage of what we just learned. So I can go back into the RGB channel. Actually, keep in mind, sky blue, which is white in this channel. Everything else is basically black. So white and black. Anyway, back with in the RGB composite, I can go into the layers panel, double click to the side of the layer, select the blue channel. And if I click and drag on the black point, I hide everything that was black, which is basically the trees and I keep the sky. But if I click and drag on this white point and drag to the left, I hide everything that was white in that channel. So then the sky magically disappears. And I can hold Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac, and click to split that point in half to create a smooth transition between invisible and visible points. See that? Uh, visible and invisible pixels. And I can click and drag the clouds layer and place it accordingly. See that? See how I just masked that out super quickly? Really, really cool stuff. So the blend if is something that you really, really should play with because it's really powerful as you can see. One thing you should realize about the blend if it's a blend, meaning you're blending pixels based on the brightness of the channel. So if you change the brightness of the channel, you will change the blend. Let me show you what I mean by that. If I decide that I want to work with my exposure adjustment layer, clip it to the layer below. A clipping mask means that you're going to only adjust the layer directly below it or the layer that it's clipped to. And I make an, an extreme adjustment. See that? See how the the blend disappears. The blend disappears because 
I or the blend changes depending on what I do because again the blend if is looking at the luminosity of each individual channel and that's how it's making the blend so if you change the luminosity you're going to change the blend so how can you make this into actual transparency you see the layer thumbnail here where it says trees you can actually see the sky see that the original sky is still there the one without the clouds so it's not really a transparent layer excuse me so how can we turn that into transparency very very simple all we need to do is right click on the trees layer and select convert to smart object and watch what happens here look at the layer thumbnail now the sky is gone and you can see the checkerboard overlay that indicates transparency so now if i create a exposure adjustment layer give it to the layer below i can adjust it all day long and the blend will never change never never change so this is a super super cool technique that you can use to create actual transparency from blend diff and if you wanted to adjust the blend diff all you have to do is double click on the smart object it opens up in a new tab here's my image as you can see and I can double click to the side of the layer to bring up the layer style window and I can continue adjusting my blend diff any way that I want and I'll make an extreme adjustment so that you can see the change I'll press OK close the smart object save and the change is applied to my smart object obviously this doesn't look very good but i just did it for the example i'll undo that Control z on windows command z on the mac um let's see if there's any questions in the chat um i haven't looked in the chat in a while let me scroll up a little bit you can rewatch this tonight yes you can melanie you can rewatch it it's you can watch it tonight or anytime that you like the recordings are all here on behance.net slash live. And something I haven't mentioned is if you're on YouTube and you want me to read your comments, make sure that you come over into behance.net slash live so that I can see the comments. I cannot see the comments on YouTube. Um, let's see. Cool. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I don't see any, I don't see, wait, how many is... How is this possible? They never mentioned that in my graphic design course. I don't know, Dana. Um, I don't know if I, I'm, I'm, I told a story before. I don't know if I told it on Adobe Live, but I, I was a, a des, uh, design major as well. And when I got to my class, I was already better than the instructor. So I wasn't, you know, too pleased with that. They didn't show me a lot of things in, in my graphic design courses. So I totally, totally get the feeling. Fun fact, I got a, a C in my Photoshop class in college because I just felt like I knew everything so I never went <laughs> so I, I actually did I didn't do too well in school in terms of grades but you should do well in school don't don't be like me um, awesome I wish there were, a, they are Adobe, cert, you can be Adobe certified. Um, I, I'm actually not Adobe certified, but you can be Adobe certified if you want. Um, I don't remember the, the link, but if you type in like Adobe certification programs, um, you can be certified by Adobe to use the apps. Um, but yeah, they have them for all the apps. Oh, I don't know if they have them for all the apps. I know I have it for Photoshop for sure. Maybe somebody in the chat could post the link to that, but they definitely do have Adobe certifications that you can take. I actually um, was talking to a client, which will remain unnamed, and the person who was trying to hire me to do a design a design for them um, wanted me to have a certificate saying that I knew how to use Photoshop, and I told her I don't have a piece of paper that says that I can use Photoshop, but I have been a speaker at Adobe's flagship conference, Adobe Max, three years in a row. Adobe has sent me out to Sydney, Australia, so I can teach Photoshop there. I've done it in Latin America. You know, I even told her I have this YouTube channel and like I do Adobe Lives and everything. And they were like, no, we want to see a piece of paper that says you can do it. And I said, all right, well, I guess I won't be helping you then. So I didn't get the job. So it's so weird how some people um, are so hung up on a piece of paper. But, you know, I've been a believer that in, in our industry, if you can do the work, you can do the work. A, a piece of paper uh, doesn't mean that you can do it but i still think it's valuable to have it it's just because it helps you uh, network learn things uh, experiment with things that maybe you would have, you would have never done on your own so yeah 
There you go. Um, thank you for posting the link in the chat, Sam. Learning.adobe.com certification.html. So, so yeah, that is the link so you can get Adobe certified. Thank you for posting it, Sam. <laughs> Sean, you should have made one in Photoshop and hand that to them. Well, no, I just didn't want to work with somebody that had that attitude. If that was the attitude to begin with, I didn't. I don't think I would want to take that person as a as a client. Um, but yeah, let's move on. We have about ten or so minutes, and there's a couple things I want to show you still. Let's see. So let me open up the next group that reads texture. So this is more of a graphic design type of thing. So if you're working with a layer that has um, you know, that you want to add texture to, you can also use the same technique to apply a texture. So I have my texture layer here. I'm going to apply it to the text layer below that reads texture. And I can double click to the side of the layer to bring up this uh, window and actually forgot to do one thing. I didn't clip it to the layer below. Control Alt G is the keyboard shortcut, Command Option G on the Mac to clip to the layer below. Uh, clipping mask simply means that the layer below controls the visibility of the layer on top. One thing that I should mention is that that's not the only keyboard shortcut. You can also hold Alt on Windows option on the Mac and hover in between the two layers and click. That also makes a clipping mask. To me, that's a little slower, so I prefer the full keyboard shortcut, Control Alt G, Command Option G on the Mac. But anyway, once that's clipped, you can move the you know the texture around anywhere that you want. It's super cool. But if you double click to the side of the layer, once again, you can use the same technique that we use to apply texture to text. So I can click and drag on the black point here and I'll hide the darker pixels and then just get that result there. See that? Really, really cool result. It just makes my text grungier. Really cool. I can double click to the side of the layer and do the opposite. Now maybe make it seem like it's rusty. Hold Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac, click and split it in half like so and you can press OK. And if you want to make it into actual transparency, you can convert it into a smart object as well. Um, and you can come in and apply, for example, a bevel and emboss. I'll reset it to default and maybe I'll change my direction to down and I can adjust the depth, the size, maybe change this to overlay and I can try to make it seem as if there's more depth in that in that text there. And maybe add a nice little drop shadow as well. Or actually maybe an inner shadow, not a drop shadow might work better in this case. Yeah, inner shadow works better in this case, like so. But anyway, so you can see that you can start adding like these really cool effects when you start mixing in blend if with everything else in Photoshop. So it's super, super cool. Um, so yeah, uh, Clarissa says this blend if is amazing. I look forward to practice with this technique. Yeah, I use it all the time and, and you can use it for all sorts of things, not just you know the, the examples that I showed you. Just think about how you would blend things in Photoshop. So we come back into our portrait layer and maybe you wanna add, I don't know, um, um, some cool shadow or something. We're gonna add a shadow over her, right? And then we'll change it into multiply, right? So that's our shadow. I know it's not the best looking shadow, but I think it'll help me prove my point. I can clip it to the layer below, Control Alt G, Command Option G on the Mac, and maybe you only want your shadow to affect the shadows, not necessarily like the highlights or maybe not the brightest highlights. Well, you can double click to the side of the layer. It brings up Blend Diff, and you can under you can uh, bring the highlights back. See that? See how I can bring the highlights back? And if I hold Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac, and click. See how I'm now just affecting like basically her hair, right? So I can press OK. I'm not affecting her hair. And then now I can adjust the opacity, right? So maybe I just want to affect her hair. See that? See how I was able to do that? Just just really quickly just target a specific area. So there's so many ways you can use Blend Diff. Just think about how you would blend things. Think about, is it bright, is it dark? Also, if you can't really see it in your head, you can come into the channels panel and just click on the different channels and then you'll realize, oh, okay, in this channel, her hair is really dark and her face is really bright. So then I can use that with Blend Diff so that I can only affect the hair, not her face or vice versa. So it's um, a powerful, powerful technique 
that I highly recommend that everybody should try it out. Um, we have about, oh my, we're out of time. Um, so let me just um, say hi to everyone in the chat one last time. Oh, I see that we have Kathleen in the chat. DCC will start in about seven minutes. She's gonna be doing her first challenge today, the challenge for the 9th of June and make sure that you go into daily creative challenge page. That's on behance.net slash challenge slash Photoshop. Make sure you click on the big blue button to take the challenge with Kathleen so you can get notified via the Creative Cloud app um, for these challenges. Make sure that you click on join the community chat so you can submit your work onto Discord. And I'm sure this will be unlocking pretty soon. Let me refresh it and make, oh, there it is. It's unlocked. You guys will be working with a cover image for your Behance project. So Kathleen will be going through that in just a moment. So make sure that you um, check her out. Also, let me bring up the schedule really quick. So we started the day with me doing getting started with masking. Let me know if you enjoyed it. Let me know if you learned some new tips and tricks. I would love to um, know if today's stream was valuable for you, what you got out of it, what you are planning on doing with what we learned. Um, then um, uh, in just a few minutes, we're gonna have Kathleen Martin doing the Photoshop Daily Creative Challenge where she will be working with a cover image for Behance. So make sure you check that out. She's coming up right after me. Then we have hand lettering with Ann Chen. So make sure you check her out at 9.30 a.m. Pacific. Then we have the Illustrator Daily Creative Challenge with Andrew Hutch Cradle at 11.30 a.m. At noon, we have Brittany Eric doing Adobe XD workflows and pro tips, and then Andrea Hawk at 2 p.m. doing Adobe XD daily creative challenge. And we'll end the day at 2.30 p.m. Pacific with a doodle therapy with Alice Lee. So awesome, awesome day. Super excited to um, check out the rest of the streams. Let me switch over into my screen. I have one minute left. And I wanna share with you guys one last resource before I go. Let me just find it here. Give me one second. If you guys go into um, YouTube, you'll see my YouTube channel. If you type in photoshoptrainingchannel.com in there or just Photoshop training channel, you don't need the .com, that's the website, but you can go to the website too. Um, but that's my YouTube channel. And if you click under playlist, there is a playlist titled Photoshop Masking Tutorials. You can click on that and you can see 21 tutorials on masking, including a blend if explanation, sort of like what I just talked about now. So make sure that you check it out. All about masking, 21 tutorials on YouTube. So once again, that's on my YouTube channel, Photoshop Training so Channel, and you can click on playlists and it's right here, Photoshop Masking Tutorials. So thank you guys so much for joining me today. Make sure that you stick around for Kathleen. She's up next doing a Photoshop daily creative challenge. She'll be working on a Behance cover and it should be pretty exciting. Check it out, go get a drink of water, come right back and join Kathleen. Thank you guys so much and I will talk to you guys again soon. Bye everybody.